having first of all been to Bletchley Park, I hope most of you have seen that episode which is out there already. We also recorded some stuff about how the listening services, the Y stations, got on to this new type of traffic which eventually needed Colossus to help the decoding of. This was this, what later became called the Lorentz cipher traffic. We covered that it was an exclusive or kind of cipher and that lots of it was picked up at listening stations and sent back to Bletchley Park. They knew that this kind of cipher was very vulnerable to attack. If any of the German operators ever disobeyed orders and sent out more than one message using exactly the same key settings on this Lorentz cipher machine. And preferably it would be good if the uh, naughty German operator sent out two long messages with the same key. Because then a very special technique could be used to try and disentangle what these messages were without even needing to know the key at all. Now that's an amazing property of exclusive all. You could perhaps even say it was a weakness or a flaw. But in wanting to explain to you exactly how this worked, I thought we'd better do it, first of all, with a simple example. If I take the letter A, and don't forget we're using five whole teleprinter code as discussed in our video on five whole paper tape. Let us take the letter A and add to it the letter Q. A is one, one, zero, zero, zero. Q is one, 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 zero, one. And remember, the plus inside a circle means do a bitwise exclusive all. So what we'll get is the following. That one, exclusive all with that one, exclusive all says if it's the same thing you're combining, then the answer is zero. If they're different, it's a one. So what this comes out to be then, one with a one, another zero, zero with a one, and that's a one, zero, one. So in fact, What's actually happened, and at this stage you have to look back in your handy teleprinter code sheet, which we'll be putting out a link to this. What on earth is 00101? And the answer is yes, that's right, it's H. That then, if you like, that's one of your plain text characters. This could be a key character supplied by the Lorentz machine. It's been randomly generated somehow. It goes without saying that people at Bletchley Park doing this stuff didn't even need to deliberately commit this stuff to memory. They just knew it after hours and hours and hours. They just knew that T combined with Z gave you E. What's happening then here, if you take successive plain text letters, successive randomly generated, you hope, key letters, is that you're ending up with a sequence of plain text letters. I'll call this the plain text stream. This, of course, is the key stream. In the case of the Lorentz cipher machine, it's pseudo-randomly generated. It was not mathematically totally random, of course. There would be a repeat cycle, but good enough to be called pseudo-random. Out here, of course, you end up with a ciphertext stream. One thing that perhaps I should remind you of, if you're not aware of it already, is the sort of self-reciprocal nature of an exclusive or system and exclusive all cipher. We've generated a cipher text character called E by adding together under exclusive all conditions a character T with a character Z. You might say, well, what would happen if I were to add the key character Z to that once again? Okay, so you've got the cipher text character, but deliberately again you rekey it with the same character Z you will end up back with 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, which of course is T. So in other words, this thing almost cycles round. You can get T, exclusive order with Z, give you an E. E, exclusive order with Z, would give you back T, and so on. What we can now say is, let's try and find the weakness in this cipher, because it's been known about ever since Victorian times, since the late 19th century. You start off saying the following. I'm just going to call the plain text stream of characters P. It's not the character P, it's not in single quotes, it's just the plain text stream. A, B, C, T, whatever. That gets exclusive ord with the key stream, which I'm going to call K, and we get C. Fine. 
the ciphertext stream. Now, special cases within those streams that you have to bear in mind when you come to look at the detail for any particular plain text stream, key stream, ciphertext stream. One or two very special cases are so important, and here's one of them. If you take any plain text character, I'll take A, it could be anything, and you exclusive order it with itself, anything exclusive order with itself, if it matches, gives a zero, A with A, or B with B, or Z with Z, will always give you five beautiful zeros. That nowadays is called a null character. Many of you will know, even ASCII has got a null character. What happens to your terminal if you send it to null character? Well, mine just ignores it. I think that's the way most terminals are set up these days. But yeah, null characters were there in teleprinter streams as well. Bletchley Park certainly did not want a null character that was generated to be ignored. And so they invented their own notation, which you have to remember, which says the null character is always signaled by a forward slash. What's the other special case then? The other special case is if you ever get to a situation of combining, shall we say, the letter A with the slash character, the null, if you think about it, exclusive ordering any of those zeros with whatever pattern A is, it's like adding zero. In other words, it leaves the A totally unchanged. So A added onto the null character is A. K added onto the null character is K. Anything added onto the null character remains itself. So I'll put a box around these and let's just bear those in mind for later on. Where's the problem come then? Okay, let's first of all take this equation. Number file stuff this. Hope we're not allergic to equations. What I can do, look, is this. Treat it just like a mathematical equation. P plus K on the left. I'm now going to add on another k to that and that doesn't matter it won't change anything so long as I also add on k to the right basically like your teacher used to say add x to both sides and or whatever so fine but look what we've just found any individual character exclusive order with itself gives a null anytime you combine a null with any character it gives any character back again in the more general case therefore K plus K, adding together identical cipher key letters, will give you a stream of nulls. Those stream of nulls, when added to the plain text, just gives you back the plain text. It doesn't alter anything in the plain text. So it's almost like exclusive or like a minus sometimes. It's like K minus K. It's a zero. It cancels out. Yeah. Exclusive or is weird like that. It's like addition without carry. It's like subtraction without borrowing. It's symmetric. So, fine, the k plus k cancels out. So, in other words, what we can say is, if you add the key back to the ciphertext, you get the plain text. We did an example of that. So far, what could be wrong with this? Ha ha, here's the problem. Suppose Sean sends me the first plain text message, P1. So, instead of P is C plus K, I'm going to write P1 gives me ciphertext 1. Okay, and if there was a second plain text, then that, when added on to k, gives the second ciphertext. So I'm just rearranging the equation like that. P1, P2, ciphertext 1, ciphertext 2, plus k on that side. Now, do yet another exclusive or addition between left-hand sides and right-hand sides. And what you get is P1 plus P2 exclusive or plus equals C1 exclusive or with C2 exclusive or with K exclusive or with K. Now as we've just discovered that cancels out K plus K. You can ignore it. So the net result of all of this is as follows. If you send two separate messages using exactly the same key the key cancels out and what you end up with is something where if you were to take the ciphertext that you've received and intercepted, don't worry about the key as long as you know it's the same key somehow or other. Just exclusive or two pieces of ciphertext together will do that. Let's call it D. So C1 exclusive order C2 is D and that must be exactly the same as the two plain texts exclusive or with each other. So essentially then, 
It's like a mashup. It's like an exclusive old mashup of two ciphertexts. Gives you exactly the same mashed up characters as it would have got by mashing up the two plain texts together with exclusive all. Therefore, it follows if P1 plus P2 is the same as this D I've invented, then by shuffling around and adding P2 to both sides, what I'm saying is if I can guess a piece of plain text called P2, and I push it through exclusive all with this D thing, which I'll do for you in a minute, I'll get a piece of P1 back. So if I get some plausible plain text from message number two, and if it gives me plausible plain text for message number one, then I'm winning. Because although they might be slightly different, a piece of good sense in one of them might give you something you recognise in the other. Well, there's nothing like a real life example to make this come alive and make you believe it really does work. Sure sent me a 21 character email message with a challenge to break this top secret cipher but i knew he'd done it like this and i experienced just like in the wartime incident sort of phoned him up and said sean my reception apparatus and my program wasn't working properly that cipher text you just sent me didn't seem to work at all something's gone wrong can you send it to me again and once again you hope like in the war, that Sean does not send exactly the same message again, but sends a slightly different one, because that makes things much, much simpler, as we'll see later. So if we concentrate now on this top block of stuff here, here's ciphertext one. Just as in good old wartime Morse code tradition, I'm breaking this string of characters up into blocks of five. That was traditional because, of course, it makes it so much easier to read things if it's broken up in this way. So these spaces that you see between every five, they're not really there. They're just to help you read. If you ever do get a genuine word space character, and that does exist in the five-hole code, then Bletchley Park had their teletypes all wired up to display a nine. And that nine meant a word space. Here's the first cipher text. W plus XAE, blah, 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 21 characters of it. And then I say to Sean, ooh, ooh, I didn't get it. Send it again. WM, JOG, DWL, and so on. What I can tell from that straight away is that since both ciphertexts started with a W, and since they use the same key, then I don't at the moment know what the plain text letter was that started them, but I know it was the same in both cases. Now, as shown, of course, look, W, exclusive order W, thing with itself, gives a forward slash, the null character. So what I've done here between C1 and C2 is what I've just been through on the theory, exclusive all them and get this magical thing called D, the mashup. That's what I always call it of the two ciphertexts. Now, successively, on either side of the mashed up ciphertexts, write down what you think is a plausible piece of plain text and push that back with exclusive all through the D string and see if anything sensible comes out for the other plain text. Now I'm going to start here on the second block down on P2, plain text 2. I'm assuming that Sean was really fed up with plain text 2 and he had to retransmit it and all of his politeness will have left him. He will have started the second email message with either a grunt or maybe just a brief hi. That's my guess anyway. So I'm guessing that in plain text 2 he might have said hi space Dave or something like that. So here you see the 9 for the word space HI9DAV. Push all of that line upwards through the corresponding character, combining them with exclusive or. What comes out? And the answer is hello. Oh, I like that. Now you see, this is where the cryptographers you know, heartbreak and joy. If you get it right, it's wonderful. But if you make the wrong guess, you've got to back off and try something different. Very frustrating. Strangely, in this example, I seem to be making all the right guesses. So, hi nine dav comes back as being hello nine. In other words, hello followed by space. Ah, so in the first one, he probably called me Dave as well, maybe? Not sure, but we can at least take the DAV here and promote it to the top line. And next time around, we say if P1 is hello 9 dav, push that through the exclusive all. And the answer is then P2 will be HI9, hi, Dave, 9, another space. This is looking good. 
So he was being all informal. He said, hi Dave, in plain text two. And it looks like the start of another word here, S. But we don't know anything about that yet. Right, now you have, well, in 1940s, several cigarettes, many more cups of coffee. Now, where do we go from here? Could it be the case that Sean is using formal language in plain text one? Hello, David, how about that? So we do that. Hey, look at this. The bottom then comes out to be, hi, Dave, C, S, W, E. Could it be see you soon, see you later, who knows? But what we can do is if we believe that C is right and is a correct word, we promote that up to the top line and make it be, hello, David, C. But through an exclusive or, comes down on the lower line on the second plain text has been, hi, Dave, C, you. Way, bingo, you. He did, he said, hi, Dave, C, you. Now, there's a well-known English phrase, see you later. So we try, of course, late down here, propagate that back up through exclusive or, and you get the word you separated with spaces. This is a fabulous method. Of course, it will only work for as long as the shorter message doesn't run out. I can only guess that at the top message, which is a bit longer, it starts with L. So almost certainly that one would have said later as well. But we've triumphed. And where the real triumph comes is for these 21 characters. You can now go back to one of the equations I wrote down for you and say, we've got ciphertext 2, we've worked out plain text 2, plain text 2 plus ciphertext 2 will give you the key. And here it is. Was it generated by a machine? No. I made it up. But there it is. And that's the moment at which you say, oh, that's fantastic. We can start to work out now exactly what that wretched machine might be doing that's generating this pseudo-random key. You start trying to run two tapes simultaneously through a piece of bespoke electronics which they invented, which will do the merging. But you must keep them in exact sync. You do not want differential stretching between the two things.